Well, hello, that's me again. Today is the September 5th. It's Tuesday, I believe, so. And we will start with um, this thing. This is me and uh, Pepe Escobar uh, having a really nice time in La Bottega Siciliana. This is a really excellent Sicilian uh, cuisine um, restaurant in Moscow, not far from Red Square. And me and Pepe, we discussed, well, for quite sometime there, for several hours actually, uh, the situation with BRICS, apart from many other military issues, which I'm not going to disclose yet, but I will eventually. So, And the importance of this was, of course, discussion of, uh, and, and the focal point, if you wish, uh, was the discussion of BRICS and what is going on with BRICS. And now we begin to get the feedback a little bit on the situation with Mr. Z basically refusing or declining to go to the G20 meeting in India. And so is, you know, Vladimir Putin who said, no, we're not interested really and I'm busy and things of this nature, obviously. So two Alexes from Duran, my good friends, they made, uh, they did a very good elaboration on this issue and uh, basically uh, uh, Alexander also when uh, talking about it he uh, underscored the fact that in the end BRICS are more important than G20 for both China and Russia and I strongly suggest you to listen to uh, uh, Alex and Alexander discussing it because there are many excellent points they make there but we will go further and we will get into the um, Opinions by Mr. Bhadra Kumar, the uh, former Indian uh, ambassador, diplomat, and you all know his wonderful blog, which is in, called Indian Punchline. And this is what he writes specifically on the situation with BRICS and G20. And uh, when he, he talks about it, he says that G20 foreign ministers failed to adopt the joint declaration and the deliberations under pressure from the G7 countries straight into the emotional statements, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov later said. Putin and Xi probably do not expect any breakthrough solution from the G20 summit. But this is what Mr. Hadra Kumar also makes this correct uh, conclusion. Basically, it actually resonates with uh, both Alex's from Duran uh, conclusion and pretty much anybody who have, uh, you know, uh, even one eye on these developments. The strong likelihood that the forthcoming daily event uh, this weekend may turn out to be the last waltz of its kind between the cowboys of the Western world and the increasingly restless global south. The revival of anti-colonial struggle in Africa is ominous. Quite obviously, Russia and China are putting their eggs in the BRICS basket. And this is absolutely correct. And again, I by no means want to uh, kind of disregard or possible, I mean, uh, points of tension and contradiction, uh, contradictions which emerge or will emerge inevitably between, say, Russia, China, India, and others. But if you remember my previous videos and you will begin to look indeed at the real economy, not this GDP garbage which is produced by World Bank, and, and even that they admit now that basically you have China, uh, Russia, and India top three, uh, top five economies in the world. So when you put together the actually industrial output of China, uh, Russia, and uh, India, it dwarfs basically the G7. It dwarfs in energy, it dwarfs in crucial uh, materials such as the steel, aluminum, uh, what, what have you. And this is extremely crucial in understanding what is going on. And the question is now that Russia, and we discussed this with, by the way, with Pepe, and that is why I put the, our photograph in the beginning together in the La Bottega Siciliana. We discussed this, but in the end, what is emerging, which is the new world order, completely new world, and we are witnesses to the uh, change the likes we've never seen in the last 500 years. What emerges is very clear, so, so to speak, a, a labor specification, specialization, so to speak, or division of labor, if you wish. 
China will be a uh, basically manufacturing hub. Russia will be energy hub, and Russia will be the one which provides the uh, uh, defense of the realm of the larger Euro Eurasian realm. And Russia has all tools for that, and we'll talk about this later down the road in this video. But just to understand how Russia is not interested anymore in such formats as G20 or even United Nations for that matter, because United Nations, the way it exists today is absolutely a uh, useless structure and utterly corrupt. And to uh, um, give you impression about this and how, for example, China, but specifically Russia, who leads the way, disregard those international institutions is this. For example, you remember this wonderful girl. This is uh, Kamila Valiva, and she was this young uh, uh, Russian uh, teenager who had been completely discredited and basically abused by the International Olympic Committee under the premises of the now most uh, 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 highly likely fake uh, failed doping uh, probes. And the kid was basically because she was so good. She was, she still is. She is above anything what Western world can pr present in terms of the women's figure skating. And uh, Russians made a conclusion after that because you, uh, when you look at the International Olympic Committee, which is the part of the institution, such as, for example, yeah, some parts of the United Nations, uh, Human Rights Watch, and things of this nature, the institutions controlled by the West, you do not have people there of integrity or honor. It is utterly corrupt. Long ago became the uh, 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 tools of the political and ideological uh, aggression against pretty much the rest of the world. And it's the only way, for example, like in the case with Camila Valiva, uh, she's so good and everybody knows who is professional in figure skating that uh, there's no even comp competitiveness and uh, competition with her. And that is why they removed her. They did everything they could to leave the road for all those capricious Western uh, athletes. I'm not saying that I don't use the broad brush trying to paint over them all as people who are nasty and uh, no have no integrity. But many of them are. They will sell their soul for just, you know, basically uh, any kind of the shot at the Olympic gold medals because it obviously has also some monetary benefits attached to it. And so now you have suddenly this guy and you know Russia have been stopped uh, from participating in the all kinds of international uh, uh, um, competitions and suddenly Mr. Bach yesterday who is the head of the International Olympic Committee says called impossible the demand of Ukraine to isolate world sport from the Russians. The Ukrainian government, he says, has stated the complete violation of all who have a Russian passport, passport which is impossible given our, our values. I can tell you what those values are, including Mr. Bach. They are bribery, they are lack of integrity, they are cowardice, and they are actually, yeah, that's the values which are professed by the International Olympic Committee. And when Mr. Bach says that it is impossible, he is wrong because it is possible, and United States States and the Western world have been working hard trying to uh, isolate Russia from the international Olympic movement, which in itself is completely corrupt. So, and Russians as such probably are facing, together with what is happening now with the G20, they look at there is a uh, basically a resurrection of the uh, new institutions on the basis of BRICS, or whatever BRICS is becoming, because obviously it's more than five countries now, and you have all kinds of interesting countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran are becoming the part of it. And when you look at this and you look at the economic might of this bloc, we'll talk about military might, you begin to understand that essentially Russians are doing correct thing. I mean, there's nothing to talk about with those people. There are no people of integrity, no people of honor in the West left in those institutions. They are basically whores. They sell to the highest bidder, bidder and the highest bidder at that time was the United States and combined West. So 
And the same is with aerospace industry, uh, especially commercial aerospace. When you single it out, the only thing w which West has still uh, advantage over BRICS, for example, in this commercial respect, because Airbus and Boeing are part of it. Same goes for the sports, primarily, because if you look at Anthony, for example, at the FIFA, but primarily UEFA, European uh, uh, Association of the Fo Football Associations, uh, and uh, you look at the you know leagues football leagues which really still sell really well and they are excellent products russians also watch this such as la liga or uh, english premier league that's about it the rest of it what's the point to go there and those people from russia those athletes who see themselves within the framework of the Inter international olympic committee and so-called international olympic movement they are free to change their citizenship but you know they have to pay back all those money which Russian state for example uh, uh, provided them by supporting them in their development as the athletes so and this is just one of the examples of how the change of the institutions is happening and this is in the process and in the progress and in this particular case uh, as many people say including Mr. Medvedev and he is not a bad cop actually people don't understand who Mr. Medvedev is he is the guy who actually uh, provides the insight into the real thinking of Russian elites nowadays. It's, he says that no, there will be never again coming back to any kind of semblance of normalcy between the West and Russia because Russians view West today as the collaborators of Nazism and actually they have a really good case for that. And this is also has the um, dramatic implications in the long run. But that's not just it, obviously. There is obviously the issue of the uh, military, special military operation, and actually, when you look attentively now at the events which are happening there, for example, if you take the Economist, it's the collection of the British imbeciles with the degrees from all kinds of the vocational schools like uh, Oxford or what have you in terms of humanities and economics, you can see yourself the Economist uh, uh, today just easily elaborates on the uh, SBU as assassination program which basically this is assassination program against anybody who collaborates with Russians and they do they do actually the same programs as much as they can in their uh, for example sleeper cells in Russia too so they kill people and economists nonchalantly discusses it because obviously uh, if MI6 will do this uh, directly there are many MI6 people which will die so but yeah because being cowards they are really glad to be covered by the SBU and for example you can remember one of such uh, uh, event which is assassination of Alexander Dugan's daughter Daria that's the kind of the people who work there they're just assassins murderers I mean thugs and that's what it is and that is why Russia will never talk to them in normal way again and when we go back to the uh, special military operation, we of course have this news now that, um, yeah, this is now confirmed, evidently the first confirmed challenger have been uh, basically destroyed those 70 tons of British pile of metal with this uh, ooh, so uh, incredible Chobom armor I mean as I already stated uh, there is no armor in the world and no ta Western tank which can sustain anything when it is applied to it by Russian Ki-52 or Krasnopol or Kitalov uh, smart munitions or Vihar uh, or Karnet ATGMs so it doesn't really Really matter. It's primarily PR, the same as most of the uh, uh, so-called Western strategists are primarily strategists in PR. They do not understand what real war is and how it is fought. And here we have it now. It's confirmed. Russians don't care that much because more challengers will be destroyed. But here's the gu guys. I don't know who those clowns are. Global military info. There are many of those outlets nowadays. And they say this video is bound to be used multiple times 
throughout the weeks to account to, for multiple challenger to losses. Well, it's hedging and it's butt hurting, obviously, but the point is Russians not going to be using it. In fact, is there was very kind of, you know, a tame uh, reaction to this, yeah, challenger, so what's the freaking big deal? And that's what they don't understand. Russians look now at uh, Western and NATO militaries as a clowns. It's a circus. And why it is so, I can demonstrate it to you. First, uh, we'll discuss what... Uh, I have the wonderful friends of mine who say, and Andre, just stop, you know, talking about it because everybody knows we understand what is going on and how it, it goes on. But still, I cannot avoid it demonstrating this. Look at this. This is foreign affairs, guys. This is the main rag of the Council on the Foreign Relations in the United States, and it's supposedly to get all those brightest and smartest, which, uh, you know, Western uh, degree mills can, could have produced. Most of them are people people who are absolutely useless and illiterate. Many of them are uncultured. I can, can point out actually number of American generals or American diplomats who really they are uncultured people. They have the, this kind of, you know, shine, uh, outside, outward shine, uh, uh, so to speak, but it's uh, skin deep and for, for the most part they are crude people with extremely low IQ. But here we have the, this Australian guy, Mick Ryan, who writes uh, five days ago, uh, you know, in foreign affairs, no less, how Ukraine can win a long war. It is hilarious article, and as I already stated, at this stage people do ask the question, do those people, those American, Australian, British generals have any degree of self-respect? Evidently they don't, because they parade themselves as clowns. And when you read this article by this Mick Ryan dude, you begin to understand that, hey, he, this is the level of probably the diploma project uh, of the uh, Russian uh, Combined Arms Military Academy lieutenant who goes out and writes, you know, some things on the issues of the uh, command and control of, let's say, tank platoon. But of course, as you always write those theses for the graduation work, you write it, including several large pages, so to speak, are dedicated to the military political justification, and that's what you would write about it. And this is the level. Actually, it's below the level of the those schools in Russia. And here it is. Who is Mr. Uh, Mick Ryan? You can take a look at him. So here's Major General Mick Ryan, Australian Army. He graduated from the Royal Military College, uh, Dantrun. Well, it's 18 months, uh, allegedly, uh, uh, school, officer school. I'll give you immediately the uh, uh, hint. You cannot prepare a real officer in 18 months. It takes years and long years. But he commanded army units as the troops, squadron, regiment, blah, 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 blah. He was in, worked in Pakistan, Afghanistan, some, you know, US joint staff. Then he has a bachelor's degree in Asian studies from the University of New England. England and this is a graduate of Australian Defense Force School of Languages. Uh, he is distinguished graduate of the United States Marine Corps Command and Staff College and a graduate of the School of Advanced War Fighting and on and on and on. And when you look at this and you begin to look at what he proposes in terms uh, for Ukraine to win this uh, long war, um, I don't know, guys. I mean, uh, let's take a look, for example, as an example, famous Moscow, what is called Moscow cadets, Moscow Combined Arms Higher uh, Academy. Actually, the photo on this here is actually of the Kazan Tank Academy. Both of them are essentially engineering schools. And in, uh, as you can see yourself from the archive, uh, in 2017, they have been returned back to normal status of the military academies. Here it is. The Moscow High Combined Arms Command and Kazan Tank Command schools were withdrawn from the military training and scientific center the uh, Common Academy of the Armed Forces of the Russian Federations and received back, I point out, back the status of independent military educational institutions. So uh, uh, this was reported uh, by Colonel General Alex Solikov, the chief of the ground forces of Russia. And let me tell you, in both of those schools, uh, you uh, get there when you're 18. The fact is you can still get when you're 16 and 17, but these are preparatory courses. But you go there after the graduation of the high school. 
you pass the exams, you pass, uh, and as you understand, Russian high school provides incomparably higher level of the mathematics and physics, for example, uh, uh, than, for example, any school in the United States, Great Britain, Germany, or Australia. And then you get into this four years, uh, six days a week, which amounts to obviously five years, into the specialty uh, w uh, programs, which are of course command and control of the personnel and units of the armed forces. This is the name of the specialty, and they are essentially engineering school. You get two degrees there. You get one essentially engineering degrees and another special, special uh, which is called equivalent of bachelor's degree in military sciences. Uh, and this is just for that type of things. Obviously in Kazan school you know who one of their graduates is and he's uh, renowned world uh, over his name is Valery Gerasimov he is the chief of the general staff but then of course if you go to the for example to the engineering schools like even ground forces engineering schools in Russia you already get into the full-blown five years six days a week which is six this is what we graduated and you get the specialty again into advanced uh, engineering degrees and you have degree in the military science which is the equivalent of bachelor's and then after that you go begin your way through all those serious all kinds of schools i went through what is called the green schools which is greening for the border guards it was called the high command courses of the kgb ussr and you go through them periodically and they it's three months courses they dr uh, drill you with the operations of for example border guards and these are complex operations believe me and then of course how you also do the interaction and uh, between uh, all kind of services and things of this nature but this is just the part of it and then of course you get into the war colleges in Russia which of course as you know war college in Russia is the two year long you get graduate degree in military sciences not bachelor's but you get equivalent of the master's degree and after that you are free to go and become of the what is called brigade level commander and then eventually if you're good once you begin to move to the divisional level you suddenly have the uh, 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 road open to you if you pass the exams of course the same as it goes for the war colleges to obviously Academy of the General Staff and when you begin to compare this, there is no comparison in terms of the academics and experiences between Russian military education and the one in NATO countries or in combined West. Nothing comparable. In fact, is for example, many of the uh, American or uh, British uh, generals, they wouldn't pass even the entrance exams to the uh, uh, initial military academies in Russia, where, which graduated with the rank of lieutenant and, as I already stated, a uh, degree in uh, uh, graduate degree in engineering and ba equivalent of bachelor's in military science. This is how complex it is but what do i know so and then then don't don't be surprised when you get those uh, kind of you know uh <coughs> interesting articles from people from this australian uh, uh armed forces who still think that you can actually defeat russia uh and ukraine can defeat russia but to kind of dispel a little bit of the uh, uh, delusions on this matter, we obviously can go and get to the very important news here. Here are the important news. Now, two days ago, it was confirmed that uh, I, you see, this is the uh, automatic uh, robot translate of the web page, and that is why the title looks funny. But reality is the, this the Su 34 multifunctional supersonic fighter bomber used a hypersonic missile dagger Kinjal during a special operation in Ukraine. Thus reported two days ago. And then suddenly, what do we have? Well, as, uh, uh, well, first, we need to keep in mind that uh, not only most likely, but highly likely, this is not the first use of Kinjal, but SU-34. And what, what rumor has it, so it is SU-34M, which is, uses Kinjal-M. And what is Kinjal-M, nobody knows, but it is more, uh, it's scarier than Kinjal, the previous Kinjal, the previous versions of Kinjal, which still are hypersonic, above Mach 10, and the range of more than 2,000 kilometers once launched from the aircraft. So, 
when you look at this this means only one thing quantity not just quality I explained it on many occasions in my videos you are free to go back into the archives and seek it out and you also go into my uh, uh, blog and see the uh, my writings on this matter and the use of the a salvo model and why you cannot intercept kinjal and especially when you cannot intercept salvo of kinjal by any present or future air defense systems which nato has uh, in its uh, possession so and uh, when you now suddenly add to the mig 31 case which we already knew there was a uh, basically a squadron of those at least 12 which have been operating and launching their uh, kinshals during uh, in special military operations suddenly you have this issue united states uses all of its isr uh, which of course it's a luxury for the united states because in the real war it would completely be devastated by russians but i mean for now they use it and they use their uh, uh, intelligence and surveillance reconnaissance assets especially in the uh, in electromagnetic spectrum and radar spectrum <coughs> from the orbit to track all those mig 31 ks which carry uh, carried only carried kinjas before then suddenly you have russia has 160 of those su 34s and this is the mainstay of the high end ground attack like it is su 25 for example and suddenly you cannot say now that oh we have mig 31k you know taking off from one of the air, uh, airfields so get ready kinjal is coming now you have su 34s who fly quite a lot you know and <coughs> have a very high operational tempo and then suddenly you don't know if it's su 34 which flies with kinjal or not and that means what you have to tell kiev to just basically constantly be on the on your toes and you know declare the uh, air defense emergency and sound air alarm because who knows it could be su-34 with kinjal or several su-34s or it could be su-34s with their normal 12 ton of the ammunition layout including all kinds of the obviously uh, air to ground missiles so that uh, brings us to the completely new situation because suddenly it's not just mig-31s you have a su-34s uh, 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 together with mig-31 case which carry can just at chmeimium so uh, how do you think uh the any kind of the naval force of nato will fare if you have for example a couple of mig-31 case and let's say four six su-34s carrying kinjals i don't think so this uh naval force will exist much longer once you know those missiles launched and that has the not just uh, the uh, uh, tactical or operational uh, uh, meaning it has an incredible um uh, strategic influence on the whole situation and <coughs> to kind of close it for today to understand what is going on and this is directly from the ministry of defense of russian federation this is uh for the third as you can see yourself the number of the equipment is just terrifying so this guy this mr ryan uh, the australian general he has to actually wrap his brain around what he is seeing here in terms of hardware which russia thrashed in the uh, you know uh, preceding 18 months and then uh, now for people to also understand how stupid all those claims about uh, uh, advances of ukraine are here it is as you can see yourself <laughs> in the south it is primarily in the blue which is about three four kilometers in three four kilometers out of the empty burned down land and then of course the same as what happened to the challenger it was together with other forces classically uh lured by russians into what is called a fire sack they went in they got burned russia has a truckload of means to annihilate any kind of the armor force and this is what i wanted to tell you today guys and as i already stated uh on a number of times i arrived to the conclusion 
that the top brass of NATO are not that professional people. You begin to understand that some those people do not understand war. They do not understand warfare. And when you begin to especially speak about on the strategic and operational level, those precisely levels on which the defeat or victory are <coughs> happening, how to explain it to them? I mean, they do not understand that. Uh, five square kilometers of the territory do not define the outcome, but annihilation of the military uh, uh, industrial potential of the enemy does. And that's the main uh, lesson. And this is what I wanted to tell you today, guys. And as always, uh, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel. And those who can afford, please support me on the Patreon or buy me a coffee and two. And guys, you have a nice rest of the week, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.